Today's main topic should be the uh, the top five bangs for your sporting buck. The best driving experience for your money. What's up, folks? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. As always, today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. We love Off the Record because they represent you, the people, the drivers. Off the Record is a service that connects you qualified human motorist with an attorney in a jurisdiction where you might need one. Did you get pulled over near your home? How about away from your home? How about in a state you only go to once a year or never again? Get pulled over, get a ticket in a place you don't want to be in, get a ticket anywhere you need off the record. They will fight that ticket uh, to the best of their ability to get those points off your record, saving you money on both the ticket, the penalties and fines, the insurance adjustment that will happen later, and generally making your life easier and less stressful. Don't plead guilty. Call off the record. I have used them multiple times in my career, and my driving record is clean as a whistle. Why are like why are whistles so clean? We have to look up later why whistles. Yeah, whist- the inside of a whistle is probably full of bacteria. Actually, I would say my driving record is cleaner than your average uh, whistle. Uh, well, we're going to come back to you on whistles. But uh, offtherecord.com slash TST, if you want to use the web browser, that'll get you 10% off all services with Off the Record. Or download the Off the Record app. Have it handy on your phone. Use code TSTPOD, T-S-T-P-O-D, on that Off the Record app. Again, offtherecord.com slash TST or code TSTPOD on the Off the Record app. Don't please guilty get off the record all right folks on this episode of the show zacharin 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 zach and i are in studio i have just returned from spain to drive the panamera turbo hybrid with the active suspension and while i can't give driving impressions yet i am talking about the coolness of the active suspension plus a review of the phil koopman book how safe is safe enough uh, and what we can learn from it about autonomous vehicle development plus our main topic of the day best bangs for your sporting buck zach and i uh, had different missions on this one i found used cars and zach found new cars so our lists don't exactly go head to head but you still get 10 interesting bang for your bucks cars let's fucking go it's the smoking tire podcast uh to those watching live good morning to those watching later uh sorry we were gone a week um I, I'm I'm literally not in LA for half of this month, and which normally would mean that you have to do twice as much content when we are in LA, and it was incredibly overwhelming. Zach was moving, and um, a couple time-consuming edits. There's just there was a lot going on, and so we had the opportunity to take a week off of of airing podcasts, and it really uh, relieved the schedule quite a bit. Um, also, uh, it looks like the rain is going to cancel. Oh, shit. Shut the fuck up. Also, it looks like uh, the rain is going to cancel our shoot on Wednesday, and the car that we were going to shoot on Friday uh, was damaged and has now been bumped to April. So maybe we do have time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We didn't. Uh, all we didn't. And th- yeah, like, and like 75 things got changed at 6 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, I was in Spain last week driving the Panamera Turbo Hybrid. Leave this one up for a second. Oh yeah, and uh, I can't talk about G wagons. I can't. Yeah, we can. Okay. I can't talk about the uh, Panamera Turbo Hybrid. Driving impressions are embargoed until. Actually, I think it's like the thirteenth. So, we could probably talk about it on the next crew show, which will air the fourteenth, and the video will air the thirteenth. Or the 14th, I forget. I think the 13th. Because it's the embargo's the 13th, but like in the afternoon. Because it's the uh, 14th Germany time midnight. So it's like four, it's either like 3 p.m. on the 13th, or we air it the next day on the 14th. It's a weekday, though. That's good. Thank God. Yeah. Unlike some, another one that we discussed where the embargo was at 3 p.m. on a Sunday. Yeah. They need to oh. stop doing that. It's the, the math, it's like, it's not that hard. Don't do that shit. Uh, but, uh, man, Seville, underrated town, lovely little place. It's not that little, but it's, uh, 
The first time I went uh, for Audi uh, two years ago, it was like a little chilly. It was like an October or November day, I think. And it was like windy and cold and like it just wasn't. It didn't have the right vibe, and like we went, I went this time, and it was 75 degrees and perfect weather, and it happened to be a bank holiday of some kind, and so everybody's just out in the street at the fucking cafes, smoking cigs, drinking beers, eating the jamon. Everyone's really nicely dressed. Um, everyone's good look, you know, pretty good looking. Um, and I walked the, – the day I, we got there, I landed at, like, 10 a.m. And I didn't have anything to do until the next day. Like, because that's just how the shit works, right? Like, I, I traveled for 24 hours to get there, land at 10 a.m., and then, and then you get the day to recover. So I walked, like, seven miles throughout the city. Um, and it's like a city built on tapas. So you can walk and, like, grab a little tapas yeah. and then, you know, keep It's going. like a marathon, but instead of the Gatorade stand, they're like, here's your tapas. Here's your jamón iberico. Right. Um, and, uh, man, fucking delightful. Just a nice place. And the roads that Porsche chose for us to drive on were fantastic. Spain's tarmac is so right? good. Yeah. So good. We, we took When we took the ferry to Morocco for the drive shoot, we had to drive through Spain. Mm -hmm. And I remember... Just the tarmac is perfect. It's, it's like France. Yeah. And a lot of it's toll roads, I think. Uh, Spain's toll roads. There weren't any outside okay. of Seville, but there, but there might have nice. been. Yeah. But, um, no, in Spain, the tarmac, even the, the B, B roads tarmac is so great. Um, and uh, the car is really, really neat in a bunch of cool ways. Um, we, uh, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it next show. Yeah. Um, you, you can go on my Instagram when Instagram comes back online and look at the video of the active suspension dancing the car. Yeah. When you told me about that, I, I was not ready for how cool that story was. Truly. Yeah. You like, said, oh, active suspension. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you no, no, no. It it's it's really active really suspension. Cool. That I, I don't, it's not a drive impression to, to say the technicalities of how it works in comfort mode. In, 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 in Sport Plus mode, it keeps the car as flat as possible, okay? It helps it corner faster by keeping it flat, okay? And it can respond. It doesn't have cameras. Like Mercedes has active suspension also, but it has a camera that scans mm -hmm. the road ahead, which is like, okay, fine, as long as the camera is clean, has good line of sight, and isn't affected by shadows or snow or dirt or anything. This is, com this is feedback through the tires. Mm -hmm. There are dozens and dozens of sensors that, can, that, that measure wheel speed against lateral G-forces, against brake input, against throttle input, against steering input, against this and that and right. blah, blah, blah. Porsches is still reactive, like it's most reactive. systems, and Mercedes is trying to be proactive. Yes, it's reactive. Um, in sport mode, it reacts in a way to keep the car as flat as possible during our, all situations. In comfort mode, it reacts to reduce the forces on the body. So if you put it in comfort mode and you carve corners, it leans like a motorcycle would lean or like a skier or an airplane would lean if it was slaloming back and forth. So it reduces some of the lateral force Correct. on you, the occupant? Correct. <clears throat> um, if you hit the brakes and slow the car down, it flares the nose That's to so slow cool. down like you would slow down a helicopter or a, a jet. And then when you accelerate, it dips the nose and raises the tail to reduce the forces on you like a, like a helicopter would. Ooh, does that also shove, I guess it has to, it shoves the rear wheels into the ground a little bit yes. for a little bit better traction. Uh, it, it is not optimized for acceleration. Mm. The, the, if you put it in Sport Plus, whatever it does there, mainly keeping the car flat, that is the optimized acceleration setting. Okay. So I asked, I go, yeah. is it, you know, does it, is it perform better if, you, if it does that? And they said, no, it just makes it more comfortable. So in the video, which I do the video on the racetrack, um, but I demonstrate, I do f four laps or so um, in the Sport Plus setting. Um, and um, and then I do two more laps in the comfort setting, and you can, I'm uh, you can see, because uh, I'm um, 
there were two cars on track, so I'm actually in one of in one of the shots where for one of the laps of the comfort setting, I get behind the other car, and and I can you can see it doing the thing. Whoa. Yeah, you can actually see it does it enough where you can see it doing it in the other car. Whoa. Yeah, it's cool. That's like yeah, your it's flight really simulator, cool. and you're chasing something. Yeah, or something. kind That's of. So yeah. Cool. So. Um, uh, I hope I, I don't think I just gave any drive impressions. I think I just gave factual information about what the suspension does. We'll find out so when our lawyer We'll find gets out contacted. if we get yelled at, but it's not a drive impression. That's a factual thing. I mean, and you can see how, how much it can move in that dancing demo on my Instagram, which people will not be able to have. The phone thing that uh -huh. I was doing, that's just for Porsche to show it off. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, you can't, you're not going to be able to make the car dance from outside the car. It, it's not for that. But oh, Instagram's down. But if you, when you open the door, it pops up to access height. That's right. So cool. it goes to max height. So it, so getting in it is more like getting into a Macan. And then you close the door and it drops back down. Well, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But you have to be, you have to know it's there because a cup. Well, the first time I did it, I, I opened the door and I leaned over and the door almost hit me in the fucking chin. Whoa! It pops up quick. You got to wow. know it's there. And, and then what is the delay? Like you op as you open the door, it goes up. If you pull the door open, yeah, it goes up as the door is swinging open. I wonder if it should. It's fast. If it should go up when you hit unlock. Uh, that way you don't get hit in the face by the door. Maybe. Yeah, uh, there's, there's something. I mean, once you know it's there, you're not going to get hit in the face by the yeah. door. But, like, it's definitely the kind of thing where if someone gets in your car for the first time, you'd want to warn them That's that it does that. <laughs> <laughs> Just be careful by the door. It hits you yeah. in the face. Mm -hmm. Your car doesn't like you very much. Um, so a full review of the uh, the Panamera next week. Uh, should, we, should we do... Uh, uh, should I talk about the weirdness of the SL43, or should we just laugh a little at this? Let's laugh at this. Okay. Okay. All right. So let me preface this little bit by saying that one story is not data. Phil Koopman would say that. I just finished his book. Everybody should read How Safe is Safe Enough. It's a bit of a textbook. In fact, it pretty much is a textbook. Um, and it's also $50. You started reading that like a month ago. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, and you read fast. I do. I, I haven't been reading it with the consistency that okay. I should have. I, I, but it's, it is dense. It's like 400 pages. And it's fucking, there's like no margins. The fucking text goes all the way. And it's like reading a textbook. Okay. Um, but it is so clear from reading this book that anybody who takes autonomy seriously, Elon Musk is just flat out lying about all this stuff. I mean, about all the about the the idea that a Tesla, as equipped, will ever drive itself freely, uh, is completely fucking either insane or a total scam. Well, and we should be clear for people that didn't listen to that show. His book isn't about Tesla specifically. No, no, it's no. About the it only, and in of fact, cars. it only mentions right. Tesla specifically in very pointed cases where, uh, where it applies. Because is he does he say in the book that like level four or five autonomy are also farther out than people think? It's not. It's it's not that. It's about his. The whole book is about how to safely design and implement an AV. And when when it's safe enough to go to market, mm -hmm. when you like how to determine what a what a safe AV is, what what safe means relative to human drivers, how to see statements by AVs as what they should include or leave out to know whether they are really prioritizing safety, mm. because the whole thing about AVs is everyone who's developing one, whether it's. Tesla or anybody else, Waymo or whatever, they're all doing it against this backdrop of safety, right? right. They're all saying, we need to do this because it'll be safer and it'll save lives. So it's, it's, it's teaching you how to evaluate if their actions line up with their statements. And so it's, it's, it sets the stage of like, and Phil Koopman is the expert nationwide on AV research. So it sets up like, in pretty plain language, it's a bunch of acronyms. But other than that, it's it's here's how you te you you listen to what this company says. Oh, we 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 say that uh, we're insured by this. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, we 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 our our AVs go against this uh, this SAE standard. Okay, well, what does that mean? Like, it basically it allows you to examine the marketing language and see if it's bullshit or not. And 
without directly saying so, it doesn't need to directly say so. The the entire Tesla self driving thing is absolute bullshit. A hundred percent. There's no way it's real. It's not. It couldn't be based on any of these standards. There's just no way. The safety is not there. If they want to market it like uh, like GM and and Ford do, the cruises, blue cruise, they're not marketed as being safer. They're marketed as being convenience driver assistance features. That's one thing. Not that GM and Ford are not are not are perfect. They're mm-hmm. far from it. But at least they're not saying if you use this system, it is safer than a human driver. Tesla is saying that, and that's why they're saying you should. We absolutely need to go to market. We absolutely need to have this, and and it's objectively, objectively untrue. So that's basically what Koopman's book about is about. And again, not specifically pointed at Tesla. In fact, the most of the examples are AV research companies like Waymo and Cruise and Uber and mm. and examples from much much more advanced vehicles proper testing vehicles than than what Tesla's doing. What Tesla's doing is not testing. It's not beta testing. They just like released garbage software and make people feel like they're testing, but they're really consumers just using an unfinished product. Anyway, so that's the, the backdrop of this story. And this is not data. This is an anecdote. So it's not necessarily indicative of a, a bigger problem, but I got sent this story by like a hundred people. It's from two days ago, and a guy uh, named Matthew Chirello uh, was driving his cyber truck across uh, the country with his wife and his young child, and tweeted uh, that he had catastrophic brake and steering failure uh, and lost brakes and steering. Did not seem to have crashed into anything. Um, but just just think it's something to uh, consider because we said several times, both with Koopman, which is how we ended up with Koopman on the show in the first place, mm-hmm. to learn about steer by wire and this sort of shit, and with Camisa, that I don't fucking trust this company to develop a steer by wire system. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see what the fo- we'll see what the follow up stories say about you know why this happened. Oh, we will not hear. Stuff. They will never tell us. We'll never find out why it happened uh, unless it happens to a thousand other trucks. Yeah, and it's absolutely unavoidable uh, that the that NHTSA has to deal with. True, it. but if this guy is a super fan, I bet he will tweet about it afterwards. Unless they tell make him sign the NDA. I, so I would argue it. that it is much more likely that there's a, a make good repair with an NDA attached. Mm. Which yeah. is a Shut the fuck up sucks. about this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what other people frequently reported about Tesla. Oh, problems. I know. Yeah. That's why I brought yeah. it up. Like, yeah. he'll, either he will be able to tweet about it and go, here's what actually went wrong. I'm a super fan. Or he won't say anything. And yeah. be like, back on the road real quick. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. But like, I don't trust steer by wire. With and, the steering and brakes. Well, it's which, also, it's also brake by wire. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. So, anyway, not data. No need to be alarmist, but just saying that's kind of the thing we said was going to happen. Hmm. Anyway, buy Koopman's book, How Safe is Safe Enough. If you're really serious about like learning about this shit, that book is so thorough that it's not – I'm not saying I'm an expert now, but like – Man, do I have a big picture of what it takes to deploy a safe AV. No one is anywhere fucking near close. Nobody. Nobody. And, like, and it, you ne- really need to know, like, a lot of nuanced shit about operational design domains, testing procedures, like, what certain things mean when they say them. And, like, you should read the book. I'll give it to you. Um, you know, and it's a dense thing. Like, reading it is much more like... <laughs> taking a college course than it is like Mm -hmm. escaping into some fucking fantasy world. But like if you actually want to know who is full of shit and who is taking things seriously, you kind of have to read this book. It seems like it highlights how complicated the problem is. So complicated. uh, Missy Cummings also told us about like Um, it's a very difficult problem to solve because there's so many variables and so many systems. So that's why that's why I say that Elon Musk is so full of shit because either his hubris, either he was so high on his own supply that he thought this would be a no a no brainer, an easy thing to do. Or he was aware of how hard it is and has just been lying about it. Those are the only two options. Hmm. Like I would lean in I would 
I would bet on it's the first one just because. Well, the second one CEO, probably cover up very confident, yeah. all that stuff, and they go, "Well, like, I think this can work." And then, and you know, the car kind of steers itself and does all these things, but it's it has a lot of holes in right. its programming, and that's why. That's why car companies typically don't sell features before they are ready, except Tesla, who does. Mm. And, like, the, the, it could totally be true that it started out that way. He thought it would be much easier to solve because humans are bad at driving and driving is easy, which is two enormous myths covered in this book. Driving is actually very hard and humans are actually very good at it. Um, and just because a, a computer doesn't get drunk or tired doesn't mean that a computer doesn't make all kind of other fucking mistakes that a human would never make. Right. It's like, it's a totally different thing. Mostly analyzing the environment. Correct. And it's like, it goes into that, you know, human error causes 94% of traffic. It's a myth. This is a myth. Human error contributes to 94% of traffic accidents. Contributes and causes are are not the same thing. It's, there's a, there's a clear uh, distinction there. And if you normalize for sobriety and you normalize for uh age it's like the the, the it's like da it's like 30 percent. oh not, wow yeah yeah it's like a whole it's a whole different thing if you if they say well this thing is better than a human driver there's like a hundred pages on comparing avs to a human driver and why it's very important to first determine what kind of human driver because not only are like uh, drivers in their 60s, like only 20% is likely to get in an accident as a driver in their 20s. But then you normalize for alcohol, and it's like a whole other different scale. Then you normalize for location. Like, like they're, you're, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but if they're talking about an average driver in, say, state A versus an average driver in state B, an average driver in city A versus city B, the, the they're all over the place. Wow. Yeah. It's like in certain places, it's one fatality per 100 million miles. In other fatality places, it's one fatality per – or four or five fatalities per 100 million miles. Like, and is that down to city planning or is that like environment, well, the, climate Yeah, stuff? I mean, it, yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons. It could be, it could be uh, 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 infrastructure – for sure. It could be the average age of the vehicles in that particular place. It could be the fact that if it's very rural, then it takes much longer for a first responder to get to you and you're mm -hmm. more likely to die from an injury versus this. I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors. And so to say average human driver means fuck all. I mean, like you're just you're leaving out 10,000 words of information that need to be in there before you compare. So in order to make an AV safer than an average human driver, it can't just be like 10 or 15% safer. It needs to be so much safer that it covers all of those right. scenarios yeah, right. and even the best drivers. So what Phil is arguing is that if you, an AV would need to be between, I, I, I think it's f uh, 50 and 100 times safer than a human driver to cover all of the possibilities for average human driver. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Like it's not ten percent safer. It's a thousand times. Like it's You need a perfect race car driver yes. kind of brain. Yes. Yeah. You need wow. a perfect perfect driver that's sober, loves Jesus, has no kids, is has easy access to a hospital. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like there's all kinds of like you need it needs to be way, 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 way better. And and also to to prove that it is way better, you need billions of testing miles. Not millions, yeah, because it's one sense. fatality per every hundred million is the sort of is the sort of baseline that they work with, and and uh, AVs have covered so far like I don't know thirty million or something test miles, but they've already had one fatality, the Uber one in Arizona. So now so you reset, to re the, clock. You reset yeah. the clock, or to get past that average, they need like. 200 million more miles. Wow. Yeah, it's you need, crazy. You need miles since last accident. <laughs> yeah. Folks, got to take one quick break for lunch. It's Factor. They're sponsoring today's episode, and they're making it better to eat better. Right? They're delicious, ready-to-eat meals are always fresh and never frozen. They're chef-crafted, dietitian-approved, and ready to go in just two minutes in that nuclear device you have in your kitchen. You've got over 35 different options to choose from every week, including 
Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, Keto, and more. There's more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today and get after your goals. Whether it's pancakes, smoothies, and more, they've got breakfast. They've got midday bites, and they've got lunches and dinners. The meals are no prep and no mess. They're ready to heat and eat, so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. Factor is super flexible. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries to work around your uh, travel schedule or your, your family schedule. Whatever you got, sign up and save. The math has been done. Factor is cheaper than takeout. Sign up and save. We've done the math. Factor is cheaper than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So head to factormeals.com slash tire50. That's factormeals.com slash tire50, and use code tire50 to get 50% off. That's code tire50 at factormeals.com slash tire50 to get 50% off. Don't forget that 50 50 is the number. It's not written out. Factormeals.com slash tire50, right? Factormeals.com slash tire50. You got it? Good. Now back to the show. Yeah, um, yeah. So so it's it's really like I mean it's an amazing book. I'm I'm probably doing a bad job of like summarizing the concepts, but like it's important to know that shit if you really either want to believe that AVs are going to work and make us safer, or if you love cars and you want a whole bunch of reasons to not think that, to think that AVs are bad. And Phil isn't, Phil is pro AV. He actually, he wants them to exist. He works on their development. So his book is not at all anti AV, but it's, it makes it very easy to spot out a, a profit motivated, VC motivated, investor exit strategy motivated player versus someone uh, uh, that really, really, really is fucking practicing what they preach in terms of safety. Well, I wonder if that's why we saw a little bit of not a pullback, but like Waymo tested in Arizona. They, they tested locally in places where they, they yeah. probably felt confident that it would yeah. work. And they're not saying that you know, it will just pick you up in the middle of a snowy mountain kind of thing. Arizona is the easiest place in America to test. It's the weather is consistent. Mm -hmm. The roads are wide. It's a grid. It's flat. There's very few pedestrians. Um, and, and that's why other companies like Cruise, like tried to do San Francisco because it's one of the hardest. Um, and obviously it didn't go so well. Um, it, that's why it's important to know about an ODD, an operational design domain, which mm -hmm. is not only where on the map, these things are designed to work, but under what weather conditions, under what light conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, Waymo's been testing here in LA for yeah. two I, years, yeah, maybe, yeah. or more, yeah, so. Um, but still with safety drivers. And then also there's a whole thing on the the role of safety drivers and the, the myth that um, number of disengagements is directly related to safety. So if a company brags about having very few disengagements, but there's a profit motive to not disengage when it would be safer to disengage. Well, right. you know what I mean? Right. So disengagements by itself is not necessarily a good metric. What is a good metric is accidents, deaths, uh, near near misses and, tra no and traffic content, violations. Hard data. Yeah, and it's traffic crazy. violations. Yeah. yeah, traffic violations is another good one. I mean, is if you're if the AV is going to run a stop sign and you disengage to make it not run the stop sign versus you look both ways, the stop sign is clear, no one's there, and you go, well, I shouldn't disengage here because that's a d disengagement's bad. Mm. It's not gonna cause an accident this time, but the thing still ran a stop sign. That's not a safety first approach. But do we know that companies are, are or t uh, safety drivers are letting those things happen? And yes, are, because um, because dis it's, it's now been sort of accepted in the major mainstream automotive press that a low number of disengagements equals a safer car. Right. A more complete self-driving yeah, system. Yeah, it's a simple metric. Right. Okay. But that's not true. Hmm. Yeah, that's not actually true. Because if you make an AV drive the same basic Phoenix bullshit routes over and over, it will eventually reduce the number of disengagements. If you then try and push 
the, tr the conditions, the location to more challenging areas, there will inevitably be more disengagements, but that does not necessarily mean that progress isn't being made. It means the safety drivers are doing their fucking jobs. Right, and they're learning and the, and the machine is learning. Yeah, like disengagement yeah. should go down over time, but it's an easy number to process to go, oh, this many disengagements per mile. And if it's a lower number, then it's bad, right? I mean, I think it's, like, it's, good, it's right? like a graph that would look like an inverse of the stock market. Yeah, where yeah. You have these ups and downs, yeah. but ultimately you want it to trend downward. You want it to trend downward, but it's not as big of a metric as people – as it's been reported to be, and it's created a perverse motivation to either not disengage when it would be safer to disengage or let the car do something dangerous because you're thinking about wanting a lower number of disengagements. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you if you have the, this car that runs the same easy route over and over and over, that's not a useful testing miles. Uh, like what kind of testing miles are you doing? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on what the goal is of that route uh, that day, that week. Like if they if they run that route a thousand times and they go, okay, well now the car knows where all the stoplights yeah. and all the stop signs are. Yeah. But now we're going to keep running the route and we're going to be testing for its ability to detect things with radar. Like, sure. So because then you remove a variable of stoplight stop signs. Right. I don't right. Know how the but testing set up. Yeah, and there's a reason to do that. But it, I'm just saying that that. The disengagements will drop sharply, but if you take that same AV and move it three miles over here at night in the rain, yeah, it's going to go up. It, it's going to go way up, right? Of and course. so, but but when you're talking about getting investments, getting positive press, whatever, I'm saying it's. I'm just saying that it's important to avoid the trap of believing that a low number of disengagements represents the type of progress that means you're you're getting in a safe AV for sure. Anywhere that's not that very specific operational design domain. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's always like a simple number that will be given to yeah. humans to make them think this is better than right. that thing. It's like yeah. zero to 60 and 2.2. You're like, yeah, but the car rides like shit. <laughs> yeah. and, but but the, the shoppers don't really know that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, that was a little more on that than I wanted to do. But um, it's an amazing book. I can't recommend it how, uh, enough. How Safe is Safe Enough by Phil Koopman. Buy it, read it, fucking learn about why so many of these companies are motivated by profit and not by safety. But, of course, they say safety because who, who doesn't want a safer car? I feel, I, you know, it, it's probably it's probably both. I mean, I hope that they have. It doesn't some mean they have a good goal at, that they want. They go. I think some people think the problem is solvable and they can't achieve this goal. And then maybe they get in there and they go, oh, fuck, this is super complicated. Or they know it's complicated, but they still believe. We've talked about this before. All of these they companies the have good faith actors. Yeah. All of them. Right. Even fucking Tesla. But um, it, it's just it is such a bigger problem than any of these companies would really like you to believe. They really want you to believe that that we are going to have a fully autonomous car in the next decade or two decades. And it's like the moon landing, it's, like the first one, you know, and they go, we're going to do it in four years. And the engineers are like, this is going to be hard. That's and, easier. You know, that's actually know, a lot saying, easier. Like, back yeah, yeah. Then, like that was that was the thing that was being said. Yeah. And it was very, very complicated. You yeah. Know, they had to figure a lot of stuff out. Yeah. But this one is because we, we have lots of un, unwilling, unwitting test subjects meaning me on my motorcycle and pedestrians and fucking whoever. Well, the variables are other human beings. Yeah. They're incredibly unpredictable, whereas you know, yeah. the, the moonshot is like math. The moon's yeah. always going to be in the same place at the same time at the same yeah. part of the and same the, time. And the, the only year. people you're really putting at risk are like the people standing within like a kilometer of the launch pad and the fucking three bags of meat in the in the rocket. Other than that, like, right. you know, we're, but to, to deploy these AV fleets in public roads... Um, you know, you, you know, it's easy to forget that they're using they're using a taxpayer funded resource for this, you know, and they have very, very little accountability back to those people. Uh, yeah, I mean, unless someone, you know, if someone gets killed, then they get sued and all that. Stuff. Yeah, but but the, the, but process. the liability, you know, it's not like they're paying. It's it, I mean, yeah, the, it's it's a it's a liability based thing. It's not a proactive based thing. So they're they're using our collective resources to develop these privately funded and 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 VC funded technologies and putting everybody else at some level of risk, some level. Um, and you know, it just it's it's 
it's a use of a public good for a profit motivated company against the backdrop of safety, but in many, many ways, safety comes second to profit. What about like Blue Cruise? I mean, which, which I think is great. They, they geofence it. Yeah. That's a much better system. And, you know, it works really, really well. Uh, they, you know, they tested on a public highway. Of sure. Course. It was just seemed like there were fewer problems or maybe less publicity. They're, they're, and they definitely didn't do the thing Tesla did, which is like, this is going to drive to the store for you and people are going to put bags in it. Like they got real yeah. aggressive. With and the Tesla also will allow autopilot and FSD to be engaged anywhere. They say right. in their marketing materials to only use it in certain places, and they could easily geofence it to those places, but they don't. I know. I used it on a yeah. rural road in, like, Georgia. Yeah, it's nuts. Like, this should not work. No, it's nuts. And if you normalize the crash statistics, um, you know, when Tesla's famous report where that everyone quotes, it says it's safer than a human driver. If you normalize that for... Only cars that have come out since the Model S came out and eliminate all cars older than that. If you eliminate, if you normalize for driver driver age and if you normalize for roadway type, meaning only highways, it's actually much more dangerous than a human driver. So if you, the, the report that is quoted does not normalize for those facts and the Noah Goodell study that Phil quotes and that Niedermeyer quotes and that I quote all the time takes that data, normalizes for those factors, and demonstrates that autopilot is actually more dangerous than a human-driven car with ADAS Whoa. in those same situations. Wow. Yeah. So, and actually, I don't know if it, if, I don't know if it normalized for sobriety, but it normalized for location, age of driver, and age of vehicle, and it absolutely inverted the fucking data that Tesla presents as showing this. this is why data is so important. One of my favorite follows on Instagram, and I've, I've been reading this person's work since I was 22, 21, uh, is uh, Lane Norton, who's a powerlifter. Mm -hmm. He's got a PhD in nutritional science, but he, but he is data driven because he has a PhD. And he, make, he does a lot of content basically yelling about charlatans who are like, fruit will kill you, <laughs> vegetables will kill you. And, he, and, and because a lot of these people who are selling their product or they're selling their diet book or whatever, right. they will quote a study, but they will misquote it yeah. or they won't read the study. And he's like, if they actually looked at the data they're citing, they would see that they are proving themselves wrong. Yeah. And he goes, look, here's the data or here's concentration or here's why this is important. And it's a, it's a really good point. Oh, it's man. like data is important. And if you use it correctly, uh, well, that's like, you, what was you, the, you what was the quote you, you just to. sent me? One of the one of the quotes we were talking about the other day, oh. where it's like, if you if you only the read. Customer's always right yeah. in a matter of taste. In matter of taste. Yeah, yeah. Everyone been, just uses the first half. Yeah. It says the customer's always right. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. That's, it, um, I was just listening on the way to Spain. I was listening to the dollop, uh, the most recent one about Chris Rufo, where it's like. Chris Who's Chris that Rufo's that that psychopath um, operative, the one who oh, based the guy black, who Blackwater. Oh, no, no, no. That's um no, no. This is the guy who, who who basically, he's like a younger Roger Stone type, who uses social media and stuff to co-opt terms like woke and CRT and DEI to spin them into meaning all the things that Republicans hate. Mm. Like any he, oh, he he says the playbook like out loud on Twitter. He says like we have successfully taken CRT oh, right. and turned guy, it yes. in and co-opted the term and turned it into yeah. basically a catch-all for anything that we don't like about lefty people yeah, or black he, people. He'll say he it says on the thing. Twitter. He's yeah, like, yeah, it's working. But he'll yeah. he'll quote studies very selectively. He'll quote bits of research and like literally the very next line will disprove the thing that he's that he's taken out of context right. yeah. yeah so yeah. anyway um that's all that uh, you should uh, listen to that new the new dollop it's fucking bananas okay it's with Chris I'm, Rufo. Real, I'm sure it'll make me really happy yeah it'll make you real happy be sure to drink <laughs> like half a bottle of bourbon and fucking drink that one uh, uh go watch our g-wagon review Video's right pretty well the g-wagon cheap versus not cheap <laughs> Yeah, did we old. actually talk about this one on the show yet? I don't know. If I don't we think did. we did. Yeah, it's um. I want to pull up those, but it's, it's kind of a fun cool. one. G wagons, and then after um after we made it, because uh, there's a bit in the video about how the 
fuel economy of the 2004 G55 and the 2024 G63 is the same. It's the same. <laughs> I was shocked it's to learn the, that fact. It's got a lot more power. It's the one. It's it goes from 350 horsepower to 577. So the technology has been implemented to give the truck. Uh, a, a three seconds quicker zero to sixty time and and, uh, and two hundred and twenty five extra horsepower, but but it is zero <laughs> and four more extra gears. It, I was yeah. I, I just was reading that and you know this thing has this five speed. The old one has a five mm. speed, which that transmission sucks. But when I looked at the number, the MPG number, and I went, he has nine gears. Nine gears and. I'm sure yours is a little better, uh, a little slipperier coefficient of drag. I, didn't I would it up, hope but so. I was, it's fuck, sure it was redesigned. It I mean, it, I would hope so. At least the front, uh, you know, the windshields are the same. It, yeah. But, uh, but man, the same. City I mean, I, I drove, well. you know, I drove the same drive to Vegas and back two weeks and two weekends in a row. First time I did it in the G63. Second time I did it in my 1991 Bentley. And the Bentley has two and three quarters extra liters of displacement one less turbocharger, and one-third the number of gears that the G-Wagon has. And it's 30 fucking years old and returned the same fuel economy. Actually, one mile per gallon better. The Bentley was one mile per gallon. Yeah, okay. I, I, I would think it would be better than that, actually. It's got three gears. <laughs> I don't know why. It's got three than fucking that. gears, dude. And the third one's real tall. It's a six and three quarter. It's actually not that tall. Oh. What's your I, it, RPM at 80 miles per hour? 2,700. Okay. Yeah, so it, it could really use a fourth gear. red line's gear. at what, four? 45. Yeah. 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 Could use another gear. Could use another gear. You should do the gear vendor thing. No, not no, for not fucking six grand. Yeah. Not, oh, it's, not, yeah. it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, it's a good idea, but it's not actually worth it. If there was a way to easily swap to a four-speed, a proper four-speed gearbox out of the later Bentley, that would be worth it, but there's not a cost-effective way to do that. Okay. Mainly because the 480 LE or 46, whatever it is, the four-speed uses a oh, console yeah. shifter, not a column shifter. Yeah, that would ruin it. It would just make, it just would fuck up everything online. it would your yeah. console is covered in H chrome H buttons controls. and shit yeah uh we'll go watch so, our g-wagon so point video. being yeah so the the uh the 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 sort of the funny thing about the g-wagons is like they i know that there is a major update to the g-wagon in 2019 but it's still in a lot of ways is that very old car i mean but other than the steering yeah uh, the powertrain in general. I mean, the powertrain always gets updated, yeah. and it was updated before 2019. Mm -hmm. But when we looked, like, when I was shooting the B-roll and looking at the car sitting side by side, and I panned so I could see both windshields, I'm like, oh, these are the same angle. Yeah. I mean, it's the same size, basically. It's the same truck. Uh, it just steers way better, and you have more power, of yeah. course. But, like, it, the diffs and all these other things, it still has all that really good hardware. Yeah. But it, even though, and, and it, there's a study that came out about the the, the greenest and least green vehicles of, of the year. And the reason I read the study, study it's like AACEE -E study like that, I, I, I think. The reason I, I found the study is because for the first time ever, ever in the history of the study, an EV is on the dirtiest <laughs> list. It won! An EV... Uh, the Hummer EV, shockingly, is the ninth dirtiest car on sale, which is crazy. And it's an EV. And it's an EV. Wow. Isn't that crazy? So are they doing all the math with mining and, and um, you know, mineral usage and, like, how do they— It's an overall, it's an overall picture. Wow, okay. Overall picture, yeah. And the study, shockingly, concludes that regardless of what powers them, smaller, lighter vehicles are greener. So, like, the, like the greenest car is, like, the Prius. Yeah, small yeah. hybrid. Um, but in the ten dirtiest list, the the number one dirtiest car on sale is the G sixty three. Wow! It out dirties the TRX, the Raptor R, uh, the and the Durango Hellcat, which are the next three on the list. It's worse than a TRX. It's worse than a TRX. What is the why? 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 What is the MPG of a TRX? I uh, I so it's I actually don't think it's purely fuel economy that makes it worse. I think it might be. The fact that it has to be shipped across the ocean, yeah, it that like, may okay. contribute to it. That's probably it. Um, it's not purely fuel economy. Yeah, because the 
uh, TRX gets 14 highway. Yours gets 16 highway. Yeah. But yeah, because it's probably the shipping. Yeah. Okay. It's probably it's a it's a communal. It's a it's a global. Uh, That's a cool thing. study. They look at it's every a cool piece. Study. I mean, the fact that an yeah. EV is on that list is. I wish it nice. came out fucking a week earlier, so I could have like said it in the video and yeah. like described that. We put the graphic up in the video so you can see it. And can you can you Google? It? I think it's A A C E E. Or if you search like Hummer EV on list of dirtiest vehicles, like that'll come up. I think it's it's some fucking unreadable act. A A C E E A C E A C E E A C E E E. What does that stand for? Uh, I don't know. American um, Car Efficiency E V E E E. So let's just we'll just yeah there it is. A C E E E. Uh, greener cars rating. So can we go down? Can you just go? You'll, if you scroll down, there's the link to the study. Go up. It's right there. The words meanest list. Oh, re- according to a report. That's the report. Okay. So let's just, we'll just real quick do the cleanest, cleanest and dirtiest. Um, greenest list, pro, Prius Prime with a green score of 71. Lexus RZ 300E, Mini Cooper SE, Nissan Leaf. Toyota BZ4X, Toyota RAV4 Prime, Hyundai Elantra Blue, Hyundai Kona Electric, Toyota Camry LE. So that those scores are from 71 to 63. Um, so those are those so are out the of, out of a possible 100. Yes, on the green score, these are all getting Ds. So and look at the C-minuses. the paragraph below this box to calculate greener car scores. Uh, they evaluate each model year on its cost to human health. From air pollution associated with vehicle manufacturing and disposal, the production and distribution of fuel or electricity, and vehicle tailpipe emissions. On that basis, ACEEE assigns a green score to more than 1,200 model year 2024 cars, including cars fueled solely by gasoline or diesel, hybrids, or electric cars. Cool. And what's wild, because I want to go to this for a second, the fact that you know this is dominated by hybrids and EVs, obviously, but the fact that the, the Hummer is then gets such a bad score yeah. despite being an EV. It's so the, the the highest scoring car is a 71 and the number 10 scoring car is a 63. And that's Kia EV6. Yeah. It's number 10. And now let's go down. So there's some like middle of the road stuff uh in and then go to the meanest list. The the worst is the G63. Number 1. And with a score of 20. 20. And then the TRX with a score of 22, the Raptor R score of 24, Escalade wow. V score of 26. Uh, Durango SRT score of 26, and then the Wrangler with a score of 27. Uh, yeah. The 392 has got to really contribute to that. But I figured that would be specific. Like they specify Raptor, they don't say F150. Yeah. So I'm surprised that it's Wrangler, not yeah. Wrangler. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Maybe they left that date that um, off. The well, look, Wagoneer. For, I mean, that's... the worst sports car is the Corvette Z06 with a score of 30. Number eight is the G550. The G, yeah, so, there's, so two, there's two variants of the G Wagon are on there. So you and your brother are both failing math. That's like <laughs> you get invited yeah. in the principal's office. Yeah. So uh, Z06, my buck is 680. So it, you know, look, I, I, I we've I, reviewed I, a lot of these we have, cars. we have, and what you and but and what happens uh, is we we make fairly straightforward statements like maybe. A company that's also pushing these hyper fuel efficient EVs could just stop building the worst fucking offenders. Right. I mean, I saw a car commercial last night that made me laugh my fucking balls off for the Dodge Hornet, which is the tiny little electric uh, hi- or hybrid crossover. Yeah. And they lined it up next to a fucking demon and a wide body charger that are just doing burnouts. And then the implication is that this is the next evolution of that. You know what? This is uh, – it's kind of like like the stock market right now. The joke is it's propped up by NVIDIA. Yeah. So yeah. it's like you had NVIDIA and yeah. you have Facebook and you have all these you – know, and so that's your EV side. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have weed stocks. Like yeah. That's your charger and your, your yeah. demon that's just offsetting your carbon. But it's like you – like it's, it's not like they don't know this. Like right. those top – the top one, two, three, four, five, six. The top five. Durango SRT, Escalade V, Raptor R, TRX, and G63. You know what those things all have in common, other than being horribly aerodynamic and heavy and supercharged V8? Well, except for the G. Profit. Oh. They are monstrously profitable. They because re- the base car is built already. Right. Yeah. So by shoving a giant engine into a thing you've already designed, 
it it is considered a halo product for a certain type of buyer and monstrously profitable. Every one of those cars has an engine that came from another car put into a giant truck that has already been developed. And so the profit motive for building these enormously uh, inefficient vehicles is, is undeniable. And, and then these same companies are also going to huge lengths to market their electrified and efficient fleet. And it's like, yo, if you just like didn't build these well, speaking these specific of if they didn't products, build these, this story came out today with the specs on the new charger. Yeah. And so, Dodge basically announced that all the chargers coming up, uh, you can get a two door or a four door, but it's going to be inline six for the ICE engines. Yeah. Or it's going to be e- two EVs. Um, so they're going to be getting rid of yeah. V8 and supercharged and all that other stuff. So their cafe average is going to go through the roof. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I, I sort of understand. Part of me understands the, the like, this is the last hurrah. So like, let's do it. But at the same time, like, last hurrah. Like it's like the environment. <laughs> like it's not the environment doesn't care about if you know what's like better for the environment. Like just stop doing it. Like if you really did know, like if you weren't motivated by profit, if you were actually motivated by doing the good thing for the environment, like you claim to be. Just stop doing the bad thing. Right. I think we have watched that yeah. zero big companies yeah. are motivated by doing the Which right thing. Which is why they need to be forced into it. So. Um, interestingly enough, well, I, I'm interested to read more about the Charger. I, I only saw this when I sat down here, so I'll read it and we'll talk about it on the next show a little more. But to that point, I am driving the Mercedes SL43 right now. And here's where I'm going to sympathize with the OEMs a little bit. Because this is a car that is, is Instagram still down? Oh, no, it just came back. It just came back. The, the SL43, this is a car. I, don't, I didn't put a picture of it yet, oh. up yet. I'm sorry. Um, it is. F1 inspired, Matt. It's F1 yeah, inspired. Yeah, it's definitely inspired. F1 inspired. So here's a really, really weird car. And, and it seems like Mercedes in a, is in a tough spot. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to make a more fuel efficient SL, uh, that could be motivated by, uh, China sales that where there's heavy taxes on big displacement or they don't want to be on the meanest list or they didn't want to be on the meanest list. And it's probably not on the meanest list. So this is a four cylinder powered SL, uh, with 375 horsepower with an electric assisted turbo to help it spool up, which I think is pretty cool tech. It's pretty cool tech. Yeah. Um, so uh, on on the one hand, I appreciate the fact that a lot of people don't need a 600 horsepower SL. They're just cruising around town. And so this power level on the surface seems like totally fine. And it looks, I think it looks nice, especially the one, the one I have outside, which is a matte bluish purple with a tan interior and uh, ball polished uh, wheels. I, I actually think it looks great. It's a fucking nice looking car. Um, but what's so weird about it, it's, is with the second you turn it on, it is a, it looks like a luxury car. It feels like a luxury car. It's priced like a luxury car. The one I'm driving is $120,000. When you start this thing, it sounds like an economy car. It's direct injection for, for banger, right? But, but worse because it's the AMG four cylinder. So it's like buzzy and like vibrating. Oh uh, right. So once you're mm. moving, when it's when so it's, it feels uh, like a CLA forty five. Yes, hatch type in thing. an SL. Yeah, which is Ooh. strange, and I can't imagine any luxury buyer would go on a test drive in this thing, and go, yes, this is the, this is the refinement I'm looking. It's Ooh. not. It's not refined. I have no problem with fuel efficiency. I have no problem with with having a, a variant that matches the needs of what is frankly most SL buyers, right, which are not hardcore motorsports. And we haven't, right. I haven't been up on the mountain yet. It might be nice. It, it, frankly, when you rev it above 2,500, it does smooth out a bit. And the gearbox is responsive, and, and the dynamics might be just fine. I've only driven it around town. But when you're sitting at a light, the, it, the mirrors, it's like the little – it's, it's like vibrating. That's not good. Yeah. Because I, I can see – 
marketing or engineer. I mean, you know, the SL and the and the AMGs in general are just they're known for the sound mm-hmm. startup. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they if they try to introduce that with this engine, yeah, that may be a misstep, which yeah. is hard because if if you made it really quiet, I'm sure some journalists would go, oh, we missed the sound, blah 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 blah. But I think it's just like you can't have both. Like I actually I love the GLA 45. Like that's a neat car and it's rowdy. It's like they it's like a little semi luxurious rally car. It, like that that car is rad. And I know a couple people that have them. Webb's got one. It's had it for loves a long time. it. Yeah. He loves it. Um, and I totally get it. But that powertrain in a hundred and twenty thousand dollar luxury GT feels all kinds of wrong. Yeah, they probably sh- they should have just tried to make the smoothest four banger you can. I guess. Yeah, or or uh, you know, inline six. Maybe an inline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have don't the they have the right? fifty three? So they have one. Um, Is there an and I've heard I've heard this that they're going to drop this when they do the EV uh, one, but it's really like I don't know one hundred twenty thousand dollars. You can get a nine eleven Carrera Cabriolet for that. Like, I, I don't know who would drive this and decide that they would rather this. Because a 911 cab, that's a pretty refined experience. You know, a six, the six-cylinder is super smooth. Um, and this is just, like, not smooth. Is this a plug-in hybrid? No. I don't think so. Okay. I'm just I'm finding spy shots of what people think is an SL53 no, it, hybrid version. Oh, so. I mean, maybe there will be one. Yeah. But uh, this thing is just weird. And so, like, I, I applaud Mercedes' efforts to make an efficient SL, but at the same time, it's got to be refined. It's, yeah, it can't be. I you agree. can't. You can't have an unrefined SL. Well, and we were texting about it, and I said, okay, well, maybe this car would be for people like in Arizona that if you don't have two hundred grand for an SL, yeah, but you want to look like you have two hundred grand, or you go, I don't need to go fast, but I like people like the idea of an SL. You'd see it at a golf course or something. And then you said you can't fit golf clubs. You in cannot that. fit golf clubs. So then in the I trunk. go, well, now I don't know who this car is for. Yeah. Because that's you you could go to a golf course in the in what the last couple decades and you'd see lots of coupes. Yep. That is the divorced man's or the successful person's vehicle of yeah. choice. Uh, it's especially really... in warm climates. But this is like who's this you can't use it for that. Yeah. How big is the trunk? Can you put Small. two like carry ons in it? No. You could put one carry on. Mm-hmm. Two backpacks. The trunk is small. Now you, it, it has this back seat, so you could throw something on the back seat if you wanted. But golf clubs, nah. Hmm. Now the, the the GT is coming out this year, and as we saw at Pebble last year, incredibly disappointingly, the GT is just a hard top SL, mm-hmm. which to me is a fucking bummer. But maybe. With it being a full hard top and not a convertible top, it'll have a reasonable trunk for Grand Tour. It also may be that, you know, we're not the customer for this. And so Mercedes knows that that if someone owns this, they probably have a crossover. If they're going to road trip, maybe they'll do that. But, but like I don't know. if my my dad was the was the customer or someone like him. Not fitting golf clubs is that, a pretty no, a big, big thing. I, fucking I was thinking F. of the carry-on thing, but not that, being able to fit golf clubs, it seems like a huge mess. That's a, that's a big F for a car like this because yeah. that's what this car would be would do. Go to the fucking golf course. Right. Um, it's You, you got to try it. You, you haven't driven it yet, and, and you got to try it, but it's like it's just so strange. I just don't know who they think wants this because mm-hmm. um, it's, it's not like something you find out later. You'd, you 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 go to a test drive at a dealer. You learn this in four seconds. Well, I think in, in going back to like the the meanest list, we want them to make more efficient vehicles. But I think here the ex- the use of this four cylinder, sorry, the way they have put the four cylinder in, yeah, the yeah. way they've tuned the exhaust and everything, it kind of is uh, contradictory to what that car is usually about. Yeah, and and I'm not saying every car needs to be a Prius. There's people that fucking comment on my Instagram all the time that like, oh, I'm a fucking piece of shit because I say that these horribly inefficient, giant, overpowered trucks are maybe a bad thing when you're also trying to market yourself as being environmentally friendly. And meanwhile, not I don't, I, I'm not driving a Prius. I'm not saying everyone needs to drive a Prius. I'm not saying everyone needs to choose the most efficient possible option all the time. I'm just saying, like, the fu- don't do the worst possible thing is all I'm saying. The execution the execution isn't really important. Yeah, yeah. 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 Particularly, I mean, you want to sell a car for 120 grand that looks like that, and it is a good-looking car. 
it's got to be refined. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's yeah. got to be refined. Buzzing at the stoplight. That's weird. Dude, I, when they, they dropped it off here, I got in it. The first time I get in it, I start it, and I just, to myself out loud, I just go, no way. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It was so crazy. That's when you want to keep uh, auto stop start I gonna, on. I was going to say, yeah. it defaults to on every time you start the car. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe Mercedes was thinking that you're not sitting at red lights with the thing idling because they intend for you to use start stop and it actually turns off the engine. Yeah. So, th th yes, it is, it is a, a rare good argument for start stop. That's funny. Yeah. But it's so, it feels like a luxury GT with an economy car powertrain, and it. it's just crazy. Well, like a, but more like a race car economy. Yeah, no, an train, like an aggressive, yeah. like a hot hatch powertrain. Yeah, yeah. Not a con not economy a car is the wrong word. Like a, like an Evo. Imagine a fucking SL with an Evo motor in it. That's exactly. what this sounds like. Yeah, it's crazy. Like someone should fucking tune because you can tune that motor like up. Someone should make like a six hundred horsepower four cylinder, and it might be kind of crazy. You'd sell uh, one kit. Yeah. All the other customers would just go buy the SL63. Um, speaking of hot hatches, should we do our main topic for mm -hmm. today? Yeah. Did you end up re redoing your list I did or not. all? Okay. So, the, the, the inspired by uh, a shoot we're doing uh, next week. In fact, by the time most people listen to this, we'll actually be at the racetrack doing an affordable, uh, affordable track car comparison, uh, which will be fun. Um, it made us think that today's uh, today's main topic should be the uh, the top five bangs for your sporting buck, the best driving experience for your money. So and, yeah, and so I, I made my list last night and then texted you at the end and I said, wait, are we doing used cars for sale or are we doing you know cars when they were new? Because we've yeah. done a lot of here's what I would have chosen when the car was new, mm -hmm. and uh, and we each went a different direction. So your list is the best bargains for sale that are used. Mine and are mine, all, all used, five and, out of five. And mine is like, here are cars through time that I think were the best bang for a buck or are currently. Okay, so mine is probably better consumer advice than yours, but yours is... Uh, right, but mine yeah. is more historical. Okay, like the other well, let's, let's start with history. What is uh, what is on your list? So everyone, everyone thinks I'm going to say Miata. I started to write down Miata, and then I looked up how expensive they were back in the day when you adjust for inflation. Uh, yeah, they're like, like the same price as they are now, maybe even a little more. More. The the um, the 96 M edition, which had like a Taurus and LSD and some other things, was 50 grand if you adjusted for today. <laughs> really? 49,000. Granted, it was like... <laughs> It had some special stuff on it, but uh, you know the car. I was shocked when I read that. So my first uh, choice would actually be the current Toyota GR86. Okay. Because a Scion FRS was twenty seven thousand dollars when they came out in twenty sixteen, which is thirty four thousand dollars in today's money, and the current MSRP of the GR is less than that. Nice. So they've actually gone down in price yeah. by like three thousand dollars. I was just talking to my mother in law about this. We were driving out. She's buying a GR. Yeah. 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 We were driving out to Monrovia, um, uh, because it was the year, the annual, the year anniversary of John's death, and we were going to do a little thing out there, and uh, and we were talking about the difference between quote the economy, and what regular people how they deal with their finances and we're and and she was like she was kind of like she's a smart a smart woman but she was sort of like i, uh, I she didn't really understand the difference she's like oh, you know the economy's doing well but everyone's complaining and it's like well there's a there's a difference between <laughs> there's a difference between the economy you know and regular people right. right and regular people see inflation the prices of their groceries and shit are going up and far faster than their wages are going up and so they can afford less. And I said, for example, there are a lot of cars that are actually adjusted for inflation cheaper than they were before. You're actually getting a lot more car for your money. But the problem is the wages have not gone up right. proportionally to inflation, so you can afford less. So it seems like the car is you're getting less for your money. But you're So that's the, the difference yeah. between the economy and everybody. And if you don't own... Assets, correct, or a lot of assets, stock market, da da da. Then you're just watching everything get more expensive. Correct. Yeah. So anyway, that you, your your point about the adjusted inflation prices of these cars is exactly that example. That was wild. Um, so yeah, the '86 definitely still good, and and that's a good one because we'll be uh, we'll be driving the Subaru version at the track next week. Um, 
So affordable, affordable it is as affordable as it can as it can reasonably be given mm-hmm. the state of our economy, of our quote economy. Uh, my first one, C five six seven Corvette, all in the same. Uh, 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 genre, all basically, uh, our advice has always sort of been just buy the newest, best equipped one you can afford. Mm-hmm. There are arguments that if you want a pure track car, a C5 or C6 Z06 is a better place to start. If you want something that's more for every day, you might want a Grand Sport or you might want a, uh, a Z51 car from a newer generation. But, um, you know, these cars have, they have great power. They have very durable powertrains. Um, they have really good balance front to rear. They can really help you get good at driving. They're really easy to place on a road or a track. They have big trunks. They can carry all your shit. They're practical enough to use as daily drivers in most climates most of the time. Um, there's endless uh, support with forums and modifications. So many people make parts for them. And, um, you know, you can get into one for as little as 10,000 bucks or as much as 40 or 50,000 bucks, depending on what your budget is. And, uh, and you can have a, a really fun sports car. Yeah. So, find a good grand sport. Grand sports is really the sweet spot. Those are that's, more expensive. Yeah. But yeah. that's, but that's still C6 grand sport is a, that's a good, that's a good sweet spot often overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that's, that's me. C567 Corvette for my, uh, my first bang for your for your buck. Uh, all right, my next one, 1999 Honda Civic SI. Oh, overlapping. Oh, That's nice. my, my next one, sixth gen. I sixth have gen. Sixth gen Honda Civic. The seventh, so sixth gen had double wishbones mm-hmm. and independent suspension all around. They got rid of that for the seventh gen. Yeah. I also think the seventh gen is ugly. Heinous looking. Really weird looking. Yeah. Interior with the floating shift. Like, Very awkward. Here? They fixed it afterwards. But, uh, but this the one, SI I think was, was simple, actually the best good. looking of the next generation. The sedans were really awful. Yes. Yeah. And the, the HP one was okay. No, that was the generation after. That was after, that was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, seventh was very awkward looking. Yeah. But look. 160 horsepower at 8,000 RPM. The engine was different than the engine from the Del Sol. It had better con rods. It had a balanced crankshaft, slipperier pistons. 31 miles per gallon highway, and it's 2,600 pounds. Yeah. Like, this is just affordable front-wheel drive fun, and it was such a good car yeah. even when it was new. You can swap in any other Honda engine. Also that. Very, I mean, you could put a K24 in one of these, you know, a K24 swap in one of these things is like less than $5,000 and the car will be a screamer, absolute screamer. But these are really, really fun to drive. Um, you don't necessarily need the SI. The SI is a collector's item now. Um, good luck finding True. a nice SI. I mean, really, a nice SI is $25,000, $30,000 for, for one that looks like that, yeah, the blue. Yeah, I know. Um, but... But uh, and that was that when the the cool like the if you know you that's like the if you know you know car of my high school, like two kids had those in my high school and they were the jam like me and Larry Casilla and our friends we had Mustangs, mm-hmm. but like the, these were when when we dr- I drove my friend's Honda and I was kind of like oh this is rad really yeah well before I had my Mustang and I had that Subaru Legacy GT yes. I got the Subaru because there was a six month waiting list on the Prelude. I wanted the Prelude S Type SH, which is the upgraded version of, of that. A little more displacement and the and the better steering and shit. But like the a bunch a couple other kids got these Civics and they were rad. So these actually are also cheaper because these were thirty one thousand uh, dollars adjusted for inflation when they were new. Yeah, they were seventeen grand. So nowadays, if so, you get one for thirty, that's what a Civic Si costs today. Yeah, the one I drove on the launch was like thirty-two grand. Been kind of flat or down technically. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Definitely agree with you on the uh, on the Honda Civic. So I'll skip that. My next one, SN ninety-five Mustang Cobra. Oh, totally, totally underrated car. Um, I uh, I. Really like these cars a lot. My my Mustang was a '94 GT that I modified in some ways. I couldn't afford the Cobra at the time, dude. I was looking on. I looked on Cars and Bids last night. Great, great Cobras, and I mean really low mile ones, like under. Uh, look up must look up Mustang Cobra, dude. The the prices on these things are so fucking low, dude. Look at this one. Uh, fourth, uh, second from the right, 96 Ford Mustang Cobra, Mystic Cobra, okay? Black leather interior, 
uh, and go down how many? This says like low miles. Uh, 81,000 81, 81, miles sold for $13,000. Wow. Dude, that is an unbelievable steal. Wait, what's the horsepower on these, though? That's a 305 horse car. So that's, that's the that's the 4.6, okay? So you can you can modify those. Yeah. It's it's not the greatest Ford motor, but the chassis, he's got a lot of, they're, they're based on Fox body architecture, but they got a lot of upgrades, steering upgrades, the front suspension's completely different. You can, you can do IRS swaps in these things from the later Cobras. Yeah. There's now an aftermarket IRS swap kit. Maxima Motorsports and others All have like stuff. unbelievable handling shit for these things. Um, I think they look good. I think they're a really good looking yeah. car. I have a video from a few years ago. Freddie bought a 96 convertible GT that just had like coilovers on it and nothing else. He brought it to California. I think he paid $3,000 for it. And I drove it and I hadn't driven one in years. And I was like, oh my God, this is a like great. It drove so nice. Go back to the main cars and bids page. There's so, so this one, there's some other ones that are like true collector grade. Like look at that, the white one on the left. There's a 96 white Cobra Coupe. 37,000, 35,000 miles. Uh, it, that was a no sale. Okay, wait, no sold. Hang on, let's, uh, there's an 18,000 mile Mystic Cobra sold for 22 grand. Wow. The one on the left, 95. That one looked a lot like my car. Same red, 95, under 50,000 miles, sold for 13,650. And 300 horsepower in 95 was a lot. Well, so 95 was a 5.0. 94, 95 was a was a five zero. They, oh, switched, they switched to the to four, yeah. Six. So all the all the parts in the world for these five O's. Oh wait, this um, has the old the same five O as the Fox body. Yes, like the but it was but thing. it made it had it had a uh, better like heads. It had a better intake manifold. It had some other stuff. There's so that engine. yeah, this one's really clean. It's the same color as my car was. Buy this car, Matt. I, dude, I, when I saw these things, fucking how cheap they were going, I put up a put up an alert, put up a notify. Did me. you? Yeah. I mean, there's, these are so cheap. And so, like, not only can you and, – and, and the Cobras particularly were, like, adult-bought and well-kept. So you find plenty of these things with, you know, 50, 60,000 miles, relatively low miles, right. in great condition, and they're going for fucking peanuts. Because the GTs were bought by – Kids. Kids. Yeah. And they still are. Yeah. And driven around. Yeah. So there's so much opportunity uh, with a car like this to to make it your own in the aftermarket and build a really, really fast, good handling car. Yeah. Maximum it's, Motorsports, like, they, they issue such good stuff. Yeah. Um, and Chris Fix, he has one of these for Derifto. They're, these are great, and I I couldn't believe I because I when I first started I was I was gonna put GT, but then I just I was like let me see what the Cobras are going for, and they're fucking cheap. Thirteen thousand dollars. That's a ton of car. That's for th a lot of car. <laughs> that's a ton of car. I mean today I I thought that would be that that feels like pricing from four years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, don't sleep on these Cobras. These are fucking cool. nice. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of was looking last night. I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> I can't have any more cars, but like if we wanted to do a TST project car, uh, another one, maybe a giveaway car or something, I would definitely be into finding a Cobra and, uh, and doing one because that would be very fun. Cause it would be real. There's, these are fun to drive, especially the 94, 95. Cause that five Oh sounds a lot better than the four six. Yeah. So you really have that Fox body old school sound that I love. Yeah. They did sound good. Yeah. The four six, you can throw a lot of good mods on it, but sure. you can mod the five. You can mod also, both. Yeah. 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 You can mod both, yeah. but like you can, you know, and, and now they have plentiful, uh, coyote swap kits you can do for these things. That would be a time. Yeah. Well, that's that's why my next car was the 2012 Mustang GT. All right. Because that is when we uh, started getting the, fo the Coyote Bug. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Same thing. I mean, it's the same formula. Like, I think the parts we the cars we've driven that had parts from Maximum Motorsports, they are not a sponsor of us. I just should probably say that. Yeah. They were the a sponsor. Car, they sponsored my Fox. Oh, that's they right. They sponsored, sponsored my Fox, Fox body. That was years ago. But... Um, the cars handle so fucking good. You don't have to do much. You don't have to do much. I think these were the nice size. This is when the retro design was still small. It you know it has grown a lot. It's when the profile looked good before the pedestrian crash standards made the hood all bulgy and weird. Um, yes, it's still a live axle, but we've driven a couple of cars that had good mods on them, and it it still handled so well. So I think they look good inside out. Coyote engine is super strong. You mm. can supercharge it if you want to. You can take all kinds of abuse. 
And yeah, they're just out. I, they, they just do everything for me. They look good. They sound good. They go fast. They make a lot of power. That's it. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, my next one, uh, BMW 330CI E46. Um, I, I, I happen to love the, uh, the E46. Wait, what year? The, uh, the E46 330CI. Okay. Um, the 330 is what uh, you would use for uh, a spec E46 uh, race car. Um, the, the engine is a lot uh, cheaper to maintain than the M3 engine. I think these cars are built very well. I think they look very good. I think the interiors are built well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when uh, name drop, when Bert Kreischer asked me what car to get Tom as a, in, an entry-level race car, this was the only car I had in mind, was, a, was an e spec E46. I drove uh, uh, my buddy Bill's um, we uh, the, Turner car yeah, at Grid Life. Uh, graphic on the front, yeah, right? the, Yeah, that's the Turner Motorsports that car thing. That amazing. It? Yeah. The balance yes. of that car is so good. Yes. And um, they're really, really fun. They're not too fast, but they're light enough and small enough. They're a great car to learn how to drive on. And they're fast enough. Yeah. I think it's 200 and... What, 230, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. They're fast. And, and 3,000 pounds when you strip them out for racing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're not crazy, crazy cheap, particularly like a manual coupe, but... Um, but compared to M3s, uh, they are a lot cheaper, and they are a lot cheaper to maintain. Yeah, I there's no notes on that. Um, Let's see what what is uh, what does CMB have for a 330Ci? Um, so yeah, under twenty. There's a oh here's a there there's go. a coupe right there. Ninety two. Ninety two hundred bucks. One family owned manual. What? Yeah. How many miles are on it? Not that Probably a really bunch. Know. 115 k. That's, not, That's bad. not bad. Holy crap! That one's got nice wheels on it too. It's got the two piece. Those are good wheels. That's a great looking car. Yeah, good, yeah. Bought, well bought for ninety two hundred bucks. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's uh, that's a good uh, that one's in decent shape too. Yeah, that's a good looking little car. Yeah, that's a great. You can do a lot with those, and you could you can turn it into anything if you wanted to. But mm -hmm. otherwise, it's just a really nice grand touring type car. Yeah, you can get a whole. Um, spec E46 like package from Turner, just like everything you need in a box to turn that car into. Let's see what, how much that cost? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, engine packages. Oh, this might be kind of hard to find. Oh. Uh, there might be separate engine packages and uh, E46. Yeah. I, All right. There, I, there is a way to do it. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it rad. is, but like you can get all the shit you need just in one one credit card swipe, and and you can build a spec E forty six that's street legal. I mean the cage, yeah, but like you don't, you, you do not handling parts on it. Yeah, you do really not in, make your car necessarily non road legal to do a spec E forty six. Yeah, that would be um, a good time. Yeah, and you can do sedans as well. Uh, what do you got next? Um, somewhat related. Uh, 2002 Subaru WRX. Yep. Um, Unsurprising. Do, 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 do. Because uh, at the time, all wheel drive was very rare, turbocharging was very rare. And these were $18,000 at the time, which is $32,000 today's money, which yeah. actually means WRXs right now are priced the way they should be priced. Uh -huh. The one we drove, the TR was like 42. Yeah. So, but it had a bunch of things on it. Um, but at the time, an R32 was twice as expensive. So all-wheel drive, fast. So it was an Audi S4. An Audi S4 was like 42,000 bucks right. in that year. I mean, this really brought all-wheel drive and turbocharging kind of down to more of the masses. Uh, the Eclipse was a front-wheel drive piece of shit at yeah. the time. And the 325XI was 10 grand more, which actually, I'm yeah. surprised it was that cheap. And before this car, a Subaru in America was not a tuner car. Not at all. Though. I had a 98 Legacy GT. The reason I got rid of it, it was a fine car, but uh, there were no parts for it. I couldn't find... The only thing you could do to a Legacy GT at the time, I shit you not, in early internet and early asking around in forums, was literally swap an STI, JDM STI motor into it. There was nothing in between. Did you do suspension? Did anyone make No anything? one made anything. Wow. No one yeah. made anything for these cars in America. It just was not a thing that was done. Yeah. Um, and I didn't at the time know where to like buy 
parts from Japan. I mean, I'm sure somebody made something in Japan. Well, this also happened at the time where YouTube internet video became a thing. So yeah. like Rally existed obviously in the 90s, yeah. but it was hard to watch unless you had speed vision. And even then all we got was the 2.5 Impreza, which yeah. was kind of slow. Yeah. And then this thing shows up. This had uh, only 40 fewer horsepower than a Mustang GT at the time, but those weighed 3,300 pounds, and this was 3,000. Yeah. These were, these were, when and the, I found four members, like these weighed 3,000 pounds with all the shit in it. When these came out, I was working at uh, Town Motors in Englewood, New Jersey. Shout out to them. And that, that was uh, Lincoln Mercury Porsche Audi Subaru. And I was a, a, a deal a assistant. So I would basically run cars back and forth to the off site lot for test drives and whatever, just whatever they needed me to do. Basically consisted of driving cars all over fucking North Jersey. And we had the S4s, which was the were the fucking jam. The B5 S4s. When those came in, it was like, oh yeah. yes. And the S8s, which was like, oh yes. But then when these came in, I had to run one up to get like tints done or something. And I drove it up fucking Route 4. I was like, holy shit, this is like 80% of the way to the S4 yeah. for like half the money. Yeah. It they were really awesome. incredible. Yeah. 220 horsepower, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, obviously, it's still tough to find a great one. These things oh, get yeah. uh, the shit eye. beat out of them. Yeah. But for new, yeah. Uh, last one on my list, uh, 987 Cayman Boxster. Um, just they, they, they drive great. Uh, there are lots of ways to uh, modify them. There are still, I mean, look at this, uh, sold for 20, there's a 2012 boxed, uh, here, let's go get an S, uh, the, right there, uh, second from the right, Guards Red, there we go, 2011 Boxster S, uh, Guards Red over Black, uh, uh, oh, and that's a no sale, bid to 25,000, let's find a sale. Sold for, oh, on the right, top right. 2007 Boxster S, 44,000 miles, sold for 19,000 bucks. I mean, that Ooh. that right there. Oh, that's a great spec, too. Is that is it a manual? I hope it's a manual. Look I hope I didn't find a Tiptronic by accident. Go to, uh, what's that interior? It look, looks like a manual. Ooh, Ooh. Tiptronic. Oh, that's why. That's yeah. why it was cheap. All right, factor in five or six thousand. I think under $30,000. Uh, we'll get you, here we go, 2007, uh, uh, the gray one, that one, yeah, 20,000 bucks, 2007 Boxster S, uh, gray over black, manual, go down, how many miles? 70,000 miles, still totally uh, within reasonable range. Warm climate owned. I mean, dude, 20 grand? You're telling me that's not 20 grand worth of fun? This is a cocoa interior, which looks pretty good. That That is easily, even if you factor in... Cup holder's falling apart, but that's okay. Even if you factor in another three to 4,000 for a big service when you first get this thing, you're. I think that's still 20 grand of fun, yeah. 25 grand of fun. Definitely. Right? Yeah. And it, it looks really good. Yeah. You're in the Porsche game you for 25,000 bucks. Um Save some money for servicing. They're tough to work on yourself because the engine has to come out for a lot of stuff. The engine coming out is not a big deal. If it's a Porsche shop, they could probably take the engine out in an hour and a half. But, like, you just can't work on a lot of stuff yourself. That's the I mean, downside. And I think this is also a super strong choice today. Mm -hmm. Even if you even you get a new one, like, you're in the Porsche club, which who cares about that? I don't really care about that. But the cars drive so goddamn well. Yeah. And they... They sound like, you know, flat six, and they look really good, and they, they just handle so good. I mean, and if you're feeling cars. fucking spicy, you know, if you're, if you're feeling spicy, Porsche shops take out engines all the time. And this came with a 3.4. Maybe you, you need the engine. But you can swap. But what happens is BBI, Demand, all these fucking shops have 3.8s and 3.6s just sitting around. They've pulled them out of other cars to build race cars. And so you can buy one of those engines from them. You got to do a little legwork, find the engine. But I guarantee you, rather than sitting on a shelf, one of these shops would be happy to take one of those extra engines, sell it to you, or trade it for your engine for some extra cash and put it in your car. You can go to a 3.6 or a 3.8 in one of these. But Tim did this in his Cayman. He bought like a shitty first gen Cayman, beat and put in a fucking 3.8 that was just sitting on a shelf wow. and put like a, the power kit on it because it was already out. So it was easy to put that stuff on. You put cams and whatever. And he's got like a 365 horsepower fucking Cayman. 
That might even be, and that might even be Cali legal because it's an upgraded Potent engine. Potentially, wow. yeah. So that's cool. It is possible to hot rod the shit out of one of these things and have a hell of a little sleeper. But Tim, make a hot rodded Cayman and then sell it to me. I, I, I think he said he wanted to sell his. If you wanted to buy his. His is a Cayman you, or a Boxster? His is a Cayman. Ooh. Yeah, his is a Cayman. Uh-oh. Yeah. It's a fucking nasty little ripper, that thing. It might be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, -oh. uh Do you have one more on your list? Yeah. Uh, well, was, I was kind of torn between a Lotus Elise or, honestly, uh, honorable mention, 911T, the new one. Oh, Carrera T? A new Carrera T is... Looks, I'd say 991 Carrera T is even, even better value. Uh, yeah, because those were 95. They were a little cheaper. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's and a little smaller. such a strong car. It's just as fun to drive most of the time unless you're doing zero to 60 runs. But mm -hmm. honestly, who cares? And it gets you in the Porsche Club. It gets you in the 911 Club. It looks as good as all of the rest of them. Yeah. And it's, it was, it was in, I think it was like $90,000 when we drove that one. The 991, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, uh, BBI and probably others have tuning packages for those cars that can make them like 500 horsepower and yeah. that's a narrow body rear drive, 500 horsepower twin turbo. It's uh, that's like that's fucking that's the going. That's a recipe, right? That's it, going. That's a DIY yeah. GT2, and mm -hmm. I think that's just an excellent car. Sure. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's our um, our main topic for today. If you've got suggestions that we missed, if you hate our choices, uh, leave us a comment, and uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll come to another. Another fun. I don't think we disagreed on any of them. Actually, I think I don't think we had, either of us had any bad choices. Though. Corvette, are you out of your fucking mind? Uh, let's do a few of these uh, Patreon cues. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna have two crew shows this week, so we're not gonna get to all of these. Plus, Parker Kligerman needs to borrow our studio in fifteen minutes, so we're gonna let him. We're gonna end at ten o'clock. Um, but let's get to some. Of course, if you want to ask us questions, get in the game, get early access to certain drops and. Uh, and uh, get an ad-free listening experience. Patreon.com slash The Smoking Tire Podcast is where you do it. Uh, uh, Jack Martin wants to know about G-Shocks. Which G-Shocks are worth getting? I mean, they're all... The same. Kind of the same. Uh, there's, there's, like, there's some, What's like... What's the most expensive G-Shock? There's the Mr. G... Some of those are thousands of dollars. I know. I want to see if they look different. They are. They have. They're kind of like metalized. I wouldn't get one of those. I would not spend thousands of dollars on a Mister G. Nope. I like um, the Cassioke, which is the one that's the G-Shock that is shaped like an octagon, sort of like a royal oak. I think those are pretty cool. And uh, Carl Ruiz gave me the carbon fiber G-Shock, which is the one of the lightest watches ever made. It's like twenty six grams. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and that's only like a couple hundred bucks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the Mr. G and it, they just look so like utilitarian yeah. that it doesn't look like an expensive watch to me. So watch people know. You there know, are like G-Shock nerds of course. who will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on G-Shocks. And it's a real like, if you know, you know thing. This has the Porsche 911 problem. Right. 911T, 911 Turbo. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Special edition. So, I, I mean, I, I don't have a real preference. They all are real functional but aesthetically i like the cassioke i think it's a good it's a good design um i like that bezel um oh boy uh murray says what's your what's your favorite celsius flavor grape baby i'm all about that grape grape um and have i thought about of the idea of buying out the mock elise and making it a giveaway no that's i don't I don't see that as being a successful business opportunity. People don't even like our new EV reviews. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think the uh, the view rate on, I don't know, maybe it'd be okay. No, there's no- Maybe giveaway would be okay. There's but. no financial, it, A, EVs are not gonna be popular in terms of a giveaway, because it, it limits you. People, if, they, if you don't have somewhere, if you don't live somewhere where you can charge that car, right. if you live in an apartment, you're not going to enter because you're going to go, true. what am I going to do? I wouldn't have entered. What am I going to do with this yeah. thing? And then also, like, it's 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 not a particularly exciting car. It's not. Yeah. I don't, that doesn't work. Uh, Ryan Hayes says, uh, K 
Can you discuss throttle mapping? Has it changed drastically over the past decade? Seems like manufacturers are moving away from Rolls Royce style tip in towards a more jumpy mapping to fake a sporty nature to consumers who only use a maximum of 40% throttle. Very true. We talked to Gail Banks' guy about this yeah. when they brought over that was it pedal monster. Yeah. But basically, a lot of sport modes just give you more throttle earlier in the pedal to make it seem like the car is faster or it gives you more excitement or whatever. And well, it's and they're more reactive. Yeah, and the manufacturers are to people see, quote, turbo lag as being a bad thing. So they're using a smaller turbo uh, that comes on earlier, that spools up faster. They want maximum torque at lower RPM so you get that off-the-line feel. Um, and a lot of people regular regular drivers don't use the top third of their power band. Mm -hmm. So if the thing feels really powerful but then sort of dies off at 4,500 RPM, that's fine for most people. They don't know the difference. Um, it's it's That's actually, to an average non-enthusiast, considered a more desirable uh, trait than having something that just slowly builds power um, up to the top of the power band. Yeah, but sometimes it's too touchy and... We've driven cars where, uh, like, setting the throttle in normal is my is was preferred for me, especially if I'm yeah. doing track stuff. I feel like I could have more nuance and like a, a more detailed conversation with the pedal than just this on-off switch. Yeah, and 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 manufacturers are also trying to downsize their displacements without reducing power. Mm -hmm. You know, they they used to be a five liter V eight, six liter V eight, whatever. Now it's a four liter V eight with turbos or a or a two liter four cylinder or whatever. So they want those engines to feel powerful in everyday situations. So yeah. Uh, the Kurt May, after driving the Morgan Super 3, would you rather have a Caterham or the Super 3? Similar products for similar prices. Caterham for me, for sure. Yeah. Just for the fun and the drift and the speed and all that stuff. I, I suppose Caterham for performance, but I don't really like I, either of them that much. I, I know you don't, and it yeah. came through in your voice. Like, yeah. Hey. I guess I'll have the tofu if for like you have. for seventy five or eighty thousand dollars. There's a lot of stuff I'd I'd rather spend my money on. I, I it's both of those are compromised product. Yeah, but the, I I think they're after different things. The yeah, Morgan is like fun and Steve Zissou, and it's like a weird spaceship thing. I, I'd rather have an statement. old Morgan three wheeler than the the new one. Because uh, if yeah. I want silly, I want maximum silly, and the old one was fucking Baron von Munchausen. Right, yeah. And the sound then, alone. Yeah. It's super great. Yeah. 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 And the new one is objectively better, but somehow less good. And and that's what we said in our video, which you should go watch. It was the worst performing video of 2024 right. so far. So go watch that, and you can see our thoughts on the Morgan Super 3, please. Sean Stewart, will we get another chance to drive the Koenig Ferrari? Um... Last I saw it, it was going to the shop. I haven't seen or heard from it shop since. The repair shop. Your, okay. No, the repair shop. Um, I want to drive it again. It seemed very promising, but I, um, yeah, I got to follow up with them. I don't know. I, I got busy and stopped thinking about it. Who knows? That could that car, the issue that broke on us, the brakes, the brakes braked, broke, broke, the brakes broke. Yes. Uh, potential has the potential to turn into an unbelievable while you're in there. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Who knows what oh went? My God. You know, that was a pretty uh, 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 unverified, Sight unseen kind of purchase. Yeah, I mean, the thing fucking showed up off a boat, and it was like, "Have a go," you know. And and so we were lucky that it ran at all. But like, who knows what's going on in there when he's when they start tearing it apart? So I don't know. Either parts will be easy to find for that special. Yeah. I mean, he, they, the owners of it know that I want to drive it, so I imagine they would call. Me. It's like the, the people who own it like would call me. I mean, they did. The reason it came right. to California at all was for me to drive it because well, it was needs... going from Japan to Boston. Oh, yeah, I didn't that's know that. where he's at. Okay. He's on the oh, East Coast. Yeah, but it, it was coming through the port on a boat. So it was either, well, put it on a truck from port and send it to Boston or send it here for us to drive and then it, and then continue the journey. I think the more work it requires, the more likely it is that we will drive it because it will need more press to yeah. justify our friend's Correct. purchase. Correct. <laughs> Correct. 
Uh, Bud215, Elantra N and Kona Ns are twenty-five dollars to $28,000, one to two years old with under 30,000 miles. Uh, what do you think of these, and how would these rank on your bang for buck list? Aren't they new, like thirty-three grand? I mean, I'm not. The difference between twenty between let's call it twenty six and thirty three. MS uh, Elantra and MSRP is thirty three seven. Yeah, I mean that is that is a discount, yeah. but but also that's not that big of a discount off of a brand new one. I mean, that's true, but if you don't want to take a five thousand dollar hit in a year, then you could buy the used one. But it's thirty thousand miles. Five thousand dollars over thirty thousand miles is only sixty cents a mile. Yeah. No, I, is that right? What? Five thousand dollars over thirty thousand. No. Is that right? Five. That's sixty cents a mile, right? Six cents a mile. That's six cents a mile, isn't it? Thirty thousand divided by five thousand. That's six. That's only six cents a mile. That's fucking yeah. cheap, man. I mean, that's. I don't think people think like that. Uh, well, you should. I think people. I think with collector cars, you're more likely to think like that, or Ferraris, or something like that, or with your repair. But like. I mean, me, I go, well, if I want an Elantra N and I can save five grand, and if I still get the warranty that transfers from Hyundai, which is like- It's 100,000 100,000 mile. 10 year, whatever the hell. And I'm, so I have 70,000 more miles of free warranty. I'd probably go with a one year old one because it's, it's warrantied and it's not gonna have that much wear on it. And I think they, I think the Elantra N is, has the strongest ratio of driving to ugliness. I think available since Gumpert came out. Right. I mean, whatever they look like crap, but they drive fantastic. It's like a cheap Civic Type R in terms of performance. Kona N's really good. It's just automatic only. Yeah, at the risk of sounding like someone who doesn't value money, which I think I am, someone who values money, I'd probably just get the good, the new one. I mean, that's a, that's just like regular ass depreciation. In fact, I think that probably holds value better. Then a regular, like a regular Elantra, probably loses more money in the first two years than the N. Than an N. Yeah, I don't know. I would probably, I mean, Under I'd probably get the new one and just have a zero mile fresh car and everything that comes with that. It, 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 it's not. It's probably not a bad used buy, but like, it's not that that big of a delta to a brand new one. I think it depends because this is also I'm looking at MSRP, so I don't think there's actually there's no there's no, a, there's no ADM and there's no there's options. No options yeah, they're part, all they're right? all it's just color. Yeah, that's yeah, there's the only no option. options. All right, so yeah. you, you know you save plus tax. Yeah, it's a few grand, but that's only if it's thirty thousand miles. It's literally that's six cents a mile. That's not a lot. I would I'd probably get the new one. I'd get the used one. Yeah, Justin. Uh, Justin Gerard, where to get a nice. Uh, leather strap. I like the strap tailor. Find him on Instagram. Uh, he does great work. I have several straps from the strap tailor. That's where I would go. Uh, Tim A. Opinions on Porsche slant nose design. Uh, do you think a modern interpretation building off the 2019 935 would be a desirable special edition 911? Didn't they do? Make they that? did. The 930. The actual 935 is a slant nose. Right. I don't know. I I think the. Uh, it depends on how you feel about pop-up headlights, and I'm not that big of a fan of pop-up headlights. That's right. They look like garbage when you when you turn your lights on. Yeah, I'm I'm not a huge fan of that. If if they someone made a slant nose, look up custom Porsche 991 or 992 slant nose. Somebody made one, and it looked a little weird. It was I think it was white. Um, you see any photos of it? Yeah, I got a red one. Is it red? Yeah, there. I don't love it. Um, I think the front looks like a looks like my Acura NSX <laughs> when you do a slant nose. Actually, I I think I think they've always looked fast. Whenever they whenever I see an old nine, uh, slant nose pulling out of a driveway, I go, yeah. it just looks like a race car, uh-huh. and it looks really angry. And I bet they, you know, they they perform well. Uh, but yeah, when you put the headlights up, I think they look like shit. Yeah, like so, there's a photo on the bottom left there of one with the headlights popped. That one, that doesn't work for me. I know that just very RX7 all of a sudden. Yeah, it's not it's not really for me. I do like a, an '80s slant nose. I think that's a, aggressive. It it's it's sort of a a good period uh, look. Oh, that's Galpin's car. That obviously See, look, look at how, the color. Look at that. That's terrible. This, this, when the lights are down, 
or yeah. off. It's like this just looks like it's fast and it's running cocaine right. from Miami to Alabama. <laughs> right. And then when you put the lights up, it's no good. It's like a Miata. But, yeah. Yeah. It's no good. Uh, I like. I would like this white car we're looking at, which is a slant nose on some basket weaves. I would like it better if it had the the. I like the side scoop, but then I like the pontoon fender also. You know what I mean? Wait, what's the pontoon fender? Like right, a traditional Porsche Porsche oh. nose, traditional traditional lights. Yeah. Like I would I would take that exact white car with those gold basket weaves. Gotcha. But it, but with the the traditional front nose. Yeah. Yeah. I think people can like whatever they like, but it's yeah. Just... It's all right. I'm not going to get mad at you if you like it, but uh, not into it. Uh, Okay, Bad Gardener has a daily commute of 10 miles, but a trip of five to eight hours each way once a month. Considering replacing my Fiesta ST with a Chevy Volt because it seems it would commute and trip well, is it too focused on city driving to perform well at 80 miles an hour for hundreds of miles at a time? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think the Volt was fine on the highway. It's a great driving car. Um, I mean, you will not use gas on your daily commute, so that's nice. It gets 42 miles per gallon highway uh, and win 43 city, so... I'd probably get the second gen, not the first gen. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, yeah, you will not use gas on your daily commute at all, assuming you can plug it in at home. And then that savings would pay for the gas on your eight-hour road trip. I mean, it still gets very good gas mileage. The only thing... Is I don't think the I don't remember, but I don't think the gas tank is all that big. So I think it's like a ten gallon gas tank, which I mean, if you're getting forty two miles a gallon, that's still like four hundred miles. But you may if nine you, gallons. Yeah, it's small. Yeah, that's very small. So, but you know, nine to, if you start 20, your drive 16. with a full charge, that's the equivalent of an extra gallon, though, right? Uh, yeah. So. I mean, I Max think range is like 400. Yeah, I think you may you may not have <clears throat> a, quite as long of a highway range as like if you got a Prius. Yeah, but I, honestly, like 400 miles of highway That's driving, a lot. even at That's 85 hours, like I'll stop. Before That's that. a lot, but it yeah. might just like feel like you need to stop more than you so know, have range more than you even think. You have a gas tank. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, um, but I don't see any problem getting a Volt for that. I love I love a Volt. Great. Chris Bono, ever drive a car with turbos and ITBs? Um, yes, the Gunther works. Oh, yeah. The Gunther works a turbo, has turbos and ITBs. So does any turbo E46. Have you driven a turbo E46? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think I have either. Shout out to Dylan Hughes. He had his car at um, oh, yeah. Motion Engineering. But that's day. a J- 2JZ. Oh, it is, isn't that's it? That's a 2JZ okay. in there, yeah. Um, yes, go watch our Gunther works video. That has, uh, that has turbos and ITBs. Uh, how would you... Com- Crouton says, how would you compare the driving experience of the R32 GTR? Compare it to what? Uh, sorry. Maybe how would you describe the driving experience? I mean, compare it. I mean, to me, the, 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 the overwhelming thing about an R32 GTR is it drives like a much more modern car than the than if you think about any other car from 1989 or 1990. Well, Crouton's has an NA Miata, so basically... He has one, or they have one of the fairly, you know, refined but noisy driving experiences. And yeah, and GTR it says is daily is a Taycan. Smooth. Yeah, like, yeah, the the R thirty two GTR is like it's it's a smoothness thing. Um, it kind of feels like an not to bring it back to this all the time, but like it feels like a three thirty Ci, but with all wheel drive. In terms yeah, of, for me, in terms of or like quiet, a, no, like a like a three thirty five. Turbo. Uh, or, yeah, more like that. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, 335 Xi. It feels like a, a, it feels like a BMW that was made 15 years after yeah. the GTR was made. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you want to try something different, I would I would recommend something mid or rear engine. I mean, if you've already got a Taycan, you, you're in the Porsche family. So maybe maybe a Cayman or maybe a, a 911 is kind of where, where I would go from that. Or you could... You could go. Uh, I mean, you have it. You've had an NA Miata. I, I would. You've had front engine. R32 GTR is among the best of the front engine driving experiences. You might want to go mid or rear engine. Yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, great mate, mate. Live at the bottom of the hill. Difficult to get my recently purchased GT4 out of the driveway without scraping. Any suggestions for a lip guard, or should I treat it like a wear item and replace it every now and then? It is a wear item. Really? Yeah. 
That's, there's a reason Porsche's lower lips are made of plastic. They are okay. very cheap and designed to be replaced. Not necessarily every oil change, but whenever needed. They're like a new a new lower lip on a GT4 is like 300 bucks. So scrape away and replace as needed. Go on, a, go to um, Suncoast Parts, mm-hmm. Suncoast Porsche Parts, and look up um, GT4 front lip, and I bet it is relatively cheap. Two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, just fucking scrape away and and it's you know like the yellow charger guards. You know, just just use it up. Yeah, just scrape away and and replace uh, when needed. Oh, it's ten o'clock. Oh shit, Parker's probably downstairs. Oh, his thing starts at eleven. I think. Oh, eleven. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was ten. I think I said he'd be here at ten. Oh, okay. Let's do oh, one more and then okay. call. Uh, is that or is that is we'll great check. is great mate mate? Is that the end? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's no, go one one more and then we'll uh, save the rest for the next show. Okay. Um... I have, I have no idea about Gunnar Ray's question. This, that's a tough question. You would need a lot of data. Yeah, I mean, I'll read the question. Maybe someone wants to answer it in the comments. If someone gave the two of us plus Camisa a Cayman GT4 Club Sport and a pit crew, and we had to podium at Le Mans 24 hours, how far back in time do you think we'd need to go to succeed? I like this question, but But I just, I don't, yeah, no, yeah no. I don't know. My guess would be... Do we get to keep the modern tires, but... Yeah, as is. Go back in time, As right? is, yeah. Okay. I, think, I mean, I think you'd have to go... 60s? Early 60s. Like, Michael I don't... Everyone's on bias ply. Yeah, like early 60s, like like 62, 63. Because I think I think fucking Bruce McLaren or Ken Miles in a GT40 big block. Oh, wait, is do we need to win outright or our class? What class? I don't Out, know. Podium at Lamar. That's outright, dude. Oh, I think we'd have to shit. go to early 60s. It would have to be when the Cobras had small blocks. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that and and people were driving like Jag C types and shit like that. Well, let's see if I can find. Granted, the course is different. If I can find the fastest time in in 1962, has uh, a GT4 since... Club Sport run 24 hours of Le Mans? Is it? Do they? I think they need. They run faster cars than that. My my guess would be early 60s or something about that. No, no, but pre, eh, I might be able to beat a Ferrari GTO. Probably, but I think not our a GT40. Speed and our braking distance would be so much better. Yeah, it would just be straight line speed. Maybe we particularly would over bit. time. Yeah, like you know, in hour four, the GT4's brakes would hold up a lot better than whatever the fuck. Oh yeah, definitely. Know. Yeah, um, but that's back when the Mulsanne straight was the big straight. Right, you know, cars were running. I would say I'd say early '60s for sure. I think yeah. a big block, a big block GT40. There's no or a, a nine like a nine seventeen. That's fucking housing a GT four. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, sixty, sixty one, sixty two, maybe. Yeah, then we have a shot. Yeah, yeah. That's a fun experiment. Yeah, and that's right. without knowing any fucking lap times. Um, okay, we'll save that's these. Uh, we'll save the rest for the next crew show, which will probably be Wednesday because it's going to rain and we won't get to do our shoot. So thank you all the patrons for our questions. We will get back to yours later. Please go watch our G-Wagon comparison test. It is up on the YouTubes right now. Um, Panamera Turbo E-Hybrid will be out on Wednesday the 13th in the afternoon or possibly Thursday the 14th in the morning. And uh, love you all. See you later. Bye.